I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue is we're talking about homelessness. The homeless count is out, and despite billions of spending in California's biggest county, the number of homeless is up. Plus, the issue is Donald Trump's rising poll numbers in the Republican primary. Can anybody beat him? Our panel this week, Peter Hamby of Puck News and GOP strategist Mike Murphy. Then, the issue is papal visit. What did Pope Francis tell Rick Caruso about California? Caruso is here, as the issue is, starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. We've got such a smart panel this week and so much to discuss. We're getting straight to them. With us, the winner of the Newlywed Game, Peter Hamby, <laughs> the host of Snapchat's Good Luck America and one of the founders of Puck News, which is awesome. He's host of one of my favorite podcasts. It's called The Powers That Be, and it looks at the intersection of news and politics and uh, entertainment and tech and media. Mike Murphy is a longtime Republican strategist who helped folks like John McCain, Mitt Romney, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and not Donald Trump. <laughs> He is the host of another one of my favorite podcasts, Hacks on Tap, which he hosts with David Axelrod and Robert Gibbs every week. I learn from each of you every week, so it's great to have you here to help teach our audience. Welcome, guys. Thanks Thank for having you. Us. Good yeah. to see you. Okay, so let's start with the issue of homelessness, which, of course, is the biggest issue in California and the whole state, but especially bad here in L.A. County. We got some new results for the new homeless count. I want to put it up on the screen. Year over year, homelessness up 9% in L.A. County, up 10% in LA City, and since 2015, it's up 70% in LA County. Mike, what's the politics of homelessness, and does this actually really hurt the Democrats who are in charge of this state? Well, it allows people to make a great case, outsiders, be they Republican or Democrats who aren't holding office, like, we keep pouring money at it and the situation gets worse. Very hard problem to solve, and most of them are part of a system that doesn't really have the tools to solve it. And so yeah, I think it's trouble. Yeah, I mean, Ron DeSantis, you know, not not the front runner, but maybe, maybe the Republican nominee, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, came to San Francisco recently and literally just posted up in some corner of the city and filmed in front of tents, in front of probably some addicted folks. Look at the mess that California is. We don't want the rest of the country to be like this. He routinely attacks Gavin Newsom for California being a mess. Look, this is anecdotal, less journalism. If you leave California, if you're on social media, mm -hmm. it's the number one thing people say about Los Angeles. Like, ooh, even if you go down to San Diego right. and take an Uber, I would never live up there. You step on needles in Venice Beach. Look, right. some of that is exaggerated, but some of it's not. And, and as a Venice resident, I, I think that's the case. And it is true when you travel other places, you notice there aren't as many homeless people. Mike, mm -hmm. uh, Peter brings up Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Obviously, Ron DeSantis brings up Gavin Newsom. Does this stick to him? Because it seems like right now he's oh, having so. he's I, having a good run of things. Yeah, but but he's also you know a bag of cement can win the governor's race here if it has a D painted on it. It's just the nature <laughs> of it. If Gavin Newsom was in Utah, he wouldn't be elected governor. There'd be a Republican who's politically bulletproof. So, but he's on the back nine now. I mean, what he's been reelected. I think he would like to run for president. They're doing lots of weird little presidential stunt stuff without getting in Biden's way. But, you know, I'm easy to find in the yellow pages should we need a Democratic <laughs> nominee. You know, I got a big ad with my picture. Yeah. Uh, but if he does eventually run in a cycle or two, if we are still branded not the opportunity state, but the left wing homeless paradise state, it's going to be a huge albatross for him. Yeah. Remember, Mike Dukak is the Massachusetts miracle, which died on a second look. And for our younger viewers, the Yellow Pages is a phone book yes, that used to yes. be up where you could look <laughs> yes. up people. Uh, yeah, the, you couldn't the, type the, into it. It wouldn't do all the work, but you could flip pages. Peter, it, it's really striking, though, in sort of right-wing media, there seems to be this assumption that Gavin Newsom is going to be the nominee. Tucker Carlson said it recently. Tommy Lahren said it recently that there's going to be this plot where somehow Biden's out and Newsom is in. Why do you think you keep hearing that on the right? Republicans don't understand Democrats and certainly how Democratic politics works, the machinery of it. And, Republic and Democrats don't understand Republican politics. That's just probably why the parties exist in the first place. The idea that, like, Biden is going to dump Kamala as VP or Biden's not going to run and Democrats are going to put up Newsom, that's just, like, not 
going to happen. I do think Newsom is crafting the space, and our mutual friend Jonathan Martin wrote about this after right. the midterms, where Newsom was thinking Democrats were going to get thumped in the midterms. Fast forward a couple days, oh, I'm going to be Biden's number one surrogate here. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the act he's doing right now. So let's talk for a moment about the way that Democrats view Republicans, because Democrats would think Donald Trump's got to be toast after everything that's happened, but the Republican base seems to love him, except for you. Uh, let's put up uh, 538, put together an average of all of the recent polls of Republican voters nationwide. Donald Trump at 52%. Ron DeSantis seems to be going in the wrong direction at 24%. Mike Pence in third place at 7%. Everybody else under 5%. Uh, mm -hmm. Are the indictments helping? I know you hope that they don't, but oh, I mean, no, no, is the look, base, I, what's going on with I'm the base? A, Cold-eyed politician. I've been yeah. in the Republican business for over 30 years. And here's a little secret from the National Consultant Union Hall. Don't trust early national primary polls if there's a contest. Because if a bunch of voters, Republicans and independents in Iowa and New Hampshire decide no more Trump, this, this thing will flip and crumble immediately. The fact so many Republicans are now in, three years ago, if you said, you know what I'm going to do? What, Governor Rick? I'm going to go primary Donald Trump. You know, your car would explode. Now, yeah. there's somebody jumping in every week. Well, it is a sign. And, and one of the people that was supposed to be the leader in all this is Ron DeSantis. He's still in second right. place, but, but not necessarily getting great marks from political reporters so far. When you look at these poll numbers you just showed, and I like that you used the pre ozempic uh, picture of Ron DeSantis in that graphic. Um, <laughs> uh, DeSantis in Iowa and New Hampshire still has huge favorable ratings among Republican voters. So. Trump went up after his two indictments so far in the polls. That was a effect of Republicans rallying to his defense. It's, but DeSantis sinking in the polls doesn't mean that they are eliminating him mm -hmm. from the choice. None of this inside baseball stuff really matters until the first debate in August and whether Ron DeSantis so is up to the challenge on that stage to throw a punch at Donald Trump or someone like Chris Christie throwing and, a punch at Donald well, Trump. Well, and let's talk about Chris Christie because you've got a great uh, podcast out on Powers That Beat that sort of does a deep dive into what's happening with Chris Christie. And you lay out the, the, this reality that most Republican voters don't want him, but a lot of Republican donors do. <laughs> What's going on there? And my colleague Teddy Schleifer at Puck also reported a lot of Democratic donors yeah, yeah. are giving money to Christie and like Super PAC. Um, he, Christie now occupies this space where it's like never Trump Republicans, people who hang out in green rooms at TV stations like us, <laughs> and Democrats who like watching him throw punches at Trump. There are some New Hampshire voters. In yeah. recent months, he's gone from 1% in New Hampshire to 7% in New Hampshire, according to San Anselm College polling, which is a good poll. He's not going to win the primary, but he will add volatility to that debate stage. And I think what's important is, unlike 2016, he gives air cover to other Republicans either to also hit Trump or to be like, you can be the stalking horse. I'll turn the camera and do my thing. Christie can be a catalyst here. What we're having is a, a Republican family discussion. And we got one brother-in-law saying, Uncle Elmo's crazy, and we got to take the car keys away, or he's going to crash the car, and we're all screwed. <laughs> and they're well, you can't talk about Uncle Elmo like that. You're, you're, all right, go home. And they throw the mean uncle out, and then there's a talk, what do we do about Uncle Elmo? <laughs> so Christie is starting the wheels moving because he's showing the other guys you can do it. And you, after Christie started, they all started inching over a little bit. And the money's pushing harder because the money doesn't want to lose. And everybody in the party except the hardest core Trump people, which is not 50%, it's 20, think Trump loses to Biden. They think he's the one guy Biden might be able to beat. Well, after this segment, Uncle Elmo's at 7%. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> see, new, new see, candidate. You know, with crazy uh, times demand yeah. crazy leadership. Yeah. I, I think Elmo has a shot. Uh, up next, our panel is going to be back to talk about President Biden, what's going on with him. But we go to break with a historic week in California politics. Robert Rivas, officially sworn in as Speaker of California's Assembly after seven years of Anthony Rendon in that job. All of California's top leaders on hand for the big celebration, which included plenty of music. So we go to break with some gospel. There's a new buzzword in the White House, Bidenomics. Bidenomics is about building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. The White House is trying to make the phrase Bidenomics stick around the country, but will that work? Back with our panel, Peter Hamby, Mike Murphy, both with, both with us. Peter, uh, 
does this make sense, Bidenomics? I mean, you know what they're trying to do here is all about the economy, right? Um, you know, the thing with phrases like this is Bidenomics might work, I guess, but like Republicans can also just take Bidenomics and make it however they want to define it too, like the inflation president, gas prices, et cetera. Right. But, you know, I think he has a very good story to tell. The problem is he's not a very good storyteller. And we also live in a media environment. It's very fractured. We have a lot of tune out among normal, normal people, independent voters, low information voters who aren't really following politics every day. And so, you know, the narratives from last year about high gas prices, the price of eggs are still around, even though the facts are there. So, you know, once we get into the campaign, they start to put paid media, surrogate stuff behind this. Hopefully the economy is better. Um, maybe it'll work, but it seems kind of gimmicky. And is, is the age thing an issue? I mean, this week we yes. find out that he has a CPAP machine. He had this event with Nicole Wallace where he's on the air with her and just sort of walks off at the end. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. every week it seems like there's something that just plays into this narrative that he's, yeah. he's an old guy. He's got two interlocking problems. There's a polling number we pay a lot of attention to called the right track, wrong track. Are people mad or happy? Are things going the right direction? We're at 70% wrong track. That is fire the president kind of number. And they got a year to move it. So they're right that the economy is the issue. The too clever by half department should not work so late at the White House. Because Bidenomics says Biden economy. And if he owns the economy right now, he's sunk. There's one other really good weather vane poll number to watch along with the right track, wrong track, which is in a general election, who's winning on the issue of the economy? Right. Biden barely, narrowly won that number, according to exit polls in 2020. But usually in modern times, whoever wins best yeah. on the economy wins the presidency. And Biden is not doing well on that number right, right now. Right now, 64% of the country do not approve of the way Joe Biden is handling right. the economy. So Joe Biden uh, doesn't have a sort of mainstream challenger in the Democratic primary, uh, but he does have Robert F. Kennedy Jr., um, who showed off some real muscle this week. And we don't mean political muscle, we mean actual muscle. Uh, here's uh, him at, at your old gym, Golds, uh -huh. Peter, what did you make of, of his form, and, and what do you make of the RFK campaign? Ah, uh, man. So, okay, you're doing like six or seven reps at 115. I mean, <laughs> Arnold would never. I would never. I could do that in my sleep. Sorry to brag. But I talked to some, I used to work out at Gold's a lot. I talked to my trainer about this. I lift weights with him. He was like, that dude's on gear. Gear is a term for steroids. Right. He looks great shirtless. Uh, yeah. But, like, look, the people on the Internet who are like, this little guy will be our most jacked president ever. People who are rooting for RFK Jr. continue to be either sort of like MAGA scoundrels who are like rooting for someone disruptive in the Democratic primary or the kind of like anti-vax wellness types who shop at Erewhon and share videos of Russell Brand on the internet. It's just like, <laughs> it's a small group of people. Yeah, although, Mike, we've, we've heard the, the gear allegations against you before. Oh, so we don't wanna, well, as Arnold's we longtime fitness coach, <laughs> right. I mean, I have my own, yeah. my own opinions. Yeah. But no, th this guy's a sideshow, but here's the dangerous part. The machine that wants clicks and views likes a sideshow. So he gets free attention, which is the old George Lakoff thing. Don't think of an elephant. Well, you know, here, yeah. think of an elephant. So they, they have some leaks in their boat that are self created to give a kook like this yeah. an opportunity makes to make trouble. a smart trouble. point, too, that RFK Jr. is leaning in to the way media works now. He's yeah, doing totally. every podcast. He's posting videos on the Internet. At a time when establishment media is, you know, going down in views, you have to do what you do, which is you do this, but you also, you know, you're on social media all the time. Right. That's how you right. reach people. And Biden, the Democratic incumbent, is an establishment media beast who is uncomfortable in those spaces. Right. And so, you know, if... RFK Jr. goes on Joe Rogan's podcast, people are talking about it. And that, that becomes right. the age thing again for Biden. He's sitting there, we gotta make a talkie and get our message out. And, and this guy's all over Instagram, you know, standing on his head in his underwear. Are you but yeah. more clicks. Are you suggesting not everybody reads David Brooks in the New York Times every week? Like, Amazingly like Biden. Not. Well, thanks guys, we really appreciate you being so smart. Uh, listen to their podcast for more of this stuff. Up next, Rick Caruso on his meeting with the Pope. We go to break with some music with Prince, uh, which I know is what you jam out to every night. Mike, My right? wife is from Minnesota. Minnesota's finest. Yeah, yeah, there you go. The Purple Man. Uh, you're watching The Issue Is. Thanks for watching. Well, check out these pictures. Rick Caruso is just back from the Vatican, where he and his family met with Pope Francis to talk about charity work in L.A., 
Caruso is a practicing Catholic. He helped build the Caruso Catholic Center at USC. It's a huge part of his life. Rick Caruso, welcome back to The Issue Is. Good seeing you. What Thanks, was, sir. What was that like? It was pretty amazing. You know, of, of all the people I'd like to meet around the world, he, he was probably one, two, three, and four. I think he's a just a remarkable human being in terms of what he stands for. We were invited there. It was an incredible honor. I was very humbled by it. And it was great to talk about Los Angeles with him. And he knows a lot about Los Angeles, which was great. And, and your message was about a lot of the charity work you do, Parlos Ninos, Operation Progress. Right. And you brought artwork yeah. from a kid that you've helped to mentor. Yeah. We've got a picture of this piece of art that we want to show. What was the story there, and, and what did you tell him about it? So I still get chills thinking about this, to be honest. This young student is a fourth grader, Parlos Ninos, sort of came from Skid Row and then into the school. And the picture and the story is about the change of his life and the opportunity that's been given him and now his future forward and how grateful he is. And um, the Holy Father was just mesmerized by it. And, and so it was really neat. His emissary is actually coming out in a few weeks and we're gonna go down to Parlos Nino so they can see it for themselves. Oh, and let's talk people real briefly on what Parlos Los Ninos and Operation Progress is for people that may not be familiar with the work. So all the students, the families that are on Parlos Los Ninos, the school that Tina and I have supported for over 30 years is literally right in the middle of Skid Row. And every one of those families are at or below the poverty line. They're all working, but they're working poor. Many of the families, four or five, living together in an apartment. Those kids go to school free of charge. And it is really the opportunity that changes their life. Operation Progress is down in South LA, in part of the Watts area. And that's where we take children that are coming out of the housing projects, Nickerson Gardens, for example. We team them up with a police officer, LAPD. They're their mentor. And then Operation Progress, with our support and others, takes care of those kids from a scholarship education standpoint from third grade all the way through college and we've had about 300 students go through there. And we've met them and been out there with there, you and it really, it really yeah, is an incredible, incredible thing. Um, I, I was thinking about you, what meeting the Pope must have felt like for you because your grandfather came here from mm -hmm. Italy with nothing, mm -hmm. serious Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, your family is very serious about this. You meet with a priest every week, right, for dinner. <laughs> right, our pastor. Were you thinking of your grandfather and yeah. that journey, and now his grandson is invited to the Vatican with the Pope? <laughs> well, I was. It's a bit overwhelming, and I, don't, I think whether you're Catholic or you're not, to meet this man, because of who he is, he's not, in my opinion, not just the Pope. And I was thinking of my grandparents and what they had to do and being poor and coming to this country. L like Francis is, Pope Francis was very poor, very poor family, did not want to be the Pope, right? And is working so hard every day to change the direction of the church. And this is why I like him so much, to make it more welcoming, to make it more accepting, to have people come in and feel good. And he, he joked, my son Alex was holding his book and he looked at Alex and he said, oh, you must be a a rebel also like me, mm. you know, because he views himself as being a rebel and really fighting the old ways. What did it mean for you to be able to introduce your <clears throat> kids to the Pope? Tough, very emotional. You know me, I'm a crybaby. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing great until I started introducing the kids. And then I got, I got choked up and he, you know, he grabbed my arm and, and uh, we just had sort of that moment together. He is a very kind, dear man. I think not I think I know, Gianna, as we left, uh, really wrapped it up well. She said, I just wanted to hug him. Hmm. He just, he has a kindness and a dearness to him, a strength, no doubt, but a kindness and a dearness to him. And his message, I said, how do you manage everything that's coming at you? And how do you prioritize and all this? He said, it's all about humor. He goes, my daily prayer every morning, and he gave us a copy of the prayer, is praying to have humor in my life. And he looked at the kids and he said, you can accomplish anything as long as you have a good sense of humor and have joy in your life. Wow. And I just thought that was so powerful because it's not what I expected for him to say. I thought maybe he'd say discernment and deep prayer. And he said, enjoy life, have humor. You can accomplish everything. How profound that is. Yeah. Uh, wow. And, and 
real quickly, I know this is not something else you're passionate about. We got the homeless count yeah. this week in Los Angeles and yeah. showed the numbers are up. This was a count done in January, right after Karen Bass took over. Your take on where things are at right now and, and what more needs to be done, because clearly not enough is being done. We spend right. billions and the problem's getting worse. Right. Crisis is growing on the street. We need to say it. Mental health crisis on the street is growing. The drug addiction on the street is growing. Uh, I saw some recent pictures today of what's happening. We have to build housing. You can't solve this problem unless you're building permanent, sustainable housing to get people off the streets and wrap it around with services. We know the solution. It's out there. Buckle down, speed up, get it done. There you go. Rick Caruso. Great to see you. Thank what a you. week for you. It was a great thanks week. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, we have some good news about our show. We're going to share that when we come back. You're watching The Issue Is. We are so grateful to the L.A. Press Club for honoring our special episode driving around L.A. with then-Mayor Eric Garcetti as the profile of the year. The organization also honoring me as TV journalist of the year. But all this really is a team effort, and I'm so lucky to work with this team every week. And that was the second coolest compliment of the week. I don't know if you subscribe to Arnold Schwarzenegger's Pump Club, but if you don't, you should. It is a free daily newsletter where he highlights good in the world. This week, he talked about the news business, and he said he reads two newspapers and tries to tune into local news in the evening, especially my friend, Alex Michelson, who's always informative and not outrageous. Thanks for watching, Governor. I was honored to join Arnold, his incredible girlfriend, Heather, this week at the Academy Museum as they showed off a new picture book by Tauschen looking at his incredible life. What a run he's on right now. His TV show, FUBAR, hit number one on Netflix this year. And the documentary about his life is the most seen documentary in the world. Not bad for a guy about to turn 76. So as we wish America a happy birthday, there's no better person to personify the American dream. We leave you with California's largest fireworks show at the Rose Bowl, America Fest. Happy 4th, everybody. We'll see you next week.